I'm just going to, I cut out <laughs> some of the, uh, I cut out some of the sensory receptors. I'm just going to focus on a, a couple last ones cleaning up from last week, um, or last time. Uh, this is the lamellated or pacinian, it's an eponym, cor uh, corpuscles. Uh, these are found in the deep layer of the dermis. They, uh, you have a nerve ending that is surrounded uh, by this sort of onion skin, multiple layers of, um, of uh, collagenous connective tissue um, that uh, have fluid layers between them. And this is responsive to deep pressure, intense deep pressure. Uh, also is sensitive to uh, high frequency uh, vibration. All right. This is a rapidly adapting uh, receptor. So again, like I said, when you, you sit down, uh, you're stimulating Piscinian corpuscles in your posterior, but they rapidly adapt. Okay. Oops. Uh, Baroreceptors, uh, just a definition there, they are receptors that are going to monitor the change in pressure. Uh, they're rapidly adapting. These are the kinds of things that I talked about when I talked about the carotid bulb and uh, the orthostatic blood pressure when uh, we were talking about homeostasis and peop old people get up too quickly uh, and there's a drop in their blood pressure. These baroreceptors are not as responsive as they are in a young adult such as yourself. So it's these baroreceptors that are monitoring pressure, um, for example, in the uh, blood. Uh, vessels. Proprioceptors, a class of uh, interoceptors that uh, have three general categories, the muscle spindle apparatus, the Golgi tendon organ, and the various receptors that you'll find in uh, the joint capsule. So uh, the muscle spindle apparatus is, uh, is giving, returning information about the uh, cr contraction, the tension, uh, the contractive uh, state of a muscle. And this is what gives rise to the MSR reflex, the muscle stretch reflex. So when you go into the doctor's office and, and she bangs you on the knee with the hammer and your knee goes whoop, that is what you are uh, stimulating, one of these um, muscle spindle apparatuses. That's, that's what's depicted in this picture here, actually within the body of the muscle. Then the Golgi tendon organs. Uh, also returning information about the tension that you're going to find in a muscle, but not actually a muscle, specifically within uh, a tendon. Um, so tendons and ligaments, giving information about that. Then finally, uh, these receptors in joint capsules. This is telling you uh, the position that a joint may, may be in, and you're going to find these in, like, the bursal capsule of, of a joint. Yeah? So Golgi tendon organs... Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't have to do with the Golgi body, or is it something that was discovered by Golgi, or does that have to do with the Golgi body? You got me flat-footed. I can't actually answer that one. I don't, I don't actually know. I'm not sure. But this is something we can discover together uh, later. I'm not sure why it's called Golgi. It may be an eponym. It sounds like it would be. I don't think it probably has anything to do with the Golgi apparatus, but I may be wrong. Um, chemoreceptors. So this is an important class of uh, receptor um, that is going to monitor a, a variety of chemical indices such as uh, the pH, uh, the dissolved carbon dioxide or oxygen, the, the, the blood gas levels in the arterial blood. Uh, these are uh, found clustered uh, in the aortic bodies, which are in the aortic arch. Uh, or in the carotid bar uh, bodies at uh, the carotid bifurcation near the, at the carotid bulb. Um, so they oops, adapt within seconds, uh, and we, we uh, also have what's called central adaptation. So there is uh, adaptation at the receptor, but the brain has its own set point, its own way of interpreting that information, and with time. So, for example, somebody with, uh, I showed that picture of my dad at the end there, I didn't really talk about him, but 
somebody with chronic pulmonary insufficiency with Lou Gehrig's or some other reason, uh, they may not be able to blow off all the carbon dioxide uh, that they should. And so their ambient baseline of carbon dioxide is elevated. The blood gas is elevated relative to a normal person. Uh, and so with time, their central adaptation, their brain becomes used to that higher ambient level, baseline level of carbon dioxide. All right, so that's what I wanted to get through last time. Now, um, structural classifications of neurons. Uh, he, there are four basic morphological uh, categories that we can break neurons into. Uh, the first is an anaxonic neuron. An anaxonic neuron um, is basically, it's got the soma, the cell body, and it's going to have a bunch of projections. And they all look the same. It's hard to know just morphologically when you're looking at it which one has the excitable membrane and which are the dendrites. Maybe this is the axon, and all these are dendrites. Maybe this is. It's, it's hard to know. It's called anaxonic. There is no axon. There is no... Uh, it's not sending a signal anywhere. It, the job of an anaxonic neuron is often in profound, in loci uh, signal processing, informational processing. Yeah, Jacob. So when you say it's axonic, does it just mean the axon, like it's one of those that looks like a dendrite, or does it really not have an axon? Like they're direct, it they're it not doesn't have an axon. There, well, there's a directionality okay. to it, but it's not sending the signal elsewhere. Okay? So, so there's an axon hillock connected directly to telodendria. Uh, there's no myelination <laughs> or continuous propagation. It's just it, the, the cell that it is meant to signal on is adjacent to it. It's right next to it. So there's like a cluster, a nuclei in the brain that has a lot of serial processing happening. It's going to, where you're not sending the signal out of that nuclei in the brain immediately. Uh, you, you would use something like an anaxonic neuron. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, because it is one of those branches. You can't tell which one is going to be efferent, not afferent. That's right. And it's, it's, this is, these are morphological characteristics. Uh, so then there's a bipolar neuron, and this has a single dendrite coming in where the signal passes through the cell body, and then there's a single, of course, a single axon uh, heading out that goes to a uh, synaptic terminal. Next is a unipolar neuron, and you may say to yourself, uh, well, this looks kind of the same as a bipolar neuron. There is an important difference here that the uh, signal that's coming in through the dendrite, uh, whatever, whatever graded potentials are happening, those, that change in electrical field, the, the, the local, local currents, uh, is not affecting the cell body. It's, the, this current is not passing through the cell body. It goes directly into the axon. All right? So, um, the, the importance here is, and, and this is just, I'm going to like give you the tip of a much bigger, uh, perhaps at times speculative iceberg, which is that, uh, what, what is memory? Is memory uh, synaptic connectivity? Is memory uh, the architecture of a cell? How are we actually, uh, what is a qualia uh, that we experience and how is that encoded in memory? Uh, to be retrieved. There are models which say it is the quantum state of cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal elements. So uh, alpha and beta tubulin have uh, an electron and a histidine that can be either uh, promoted or um, at a lower energy state, which this is a, is a binary <coughs> quantum, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna, I don't want to go into it in depth, but it is affected by electric fields caused by graded potentials uh, from, that, are, that are happening in dendrites. And here, those electric fields are, are passing through the cell body and presumably affecting uh, the quantum states in those cytoskeletal elements in the cell body. That's not happening in a unipolar neuron, right? So that, that's, a, like a, that's a, a more um, quantum mechanical perspective of what's happening. I guess I'm a biophysicist. There are certainly uh, neuroanatomical 
uh, underpinnings for that uh, morphologic distinction as well. So then finally is the multipolar neuron. And uh, the multipolar neuron is the bulk of the neurons, uh, the interneurons in, in the central nervous system. You're going to have multiple dendrites coming in, axon hilloff, and then uh, an axonal extension. So this is the sort of standard picture of a neuron. All right. That's the neurons. There are also neuroglia. Um, half of the volume of the nervous system are neuroglia. Glial cells, G-L-I-A-L, -L, glial cells, are um, both in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. We're going to talk about the CNS first. They are non-excitable cells. They are not cells that transmit a signal or anything like that. They are like support structures. Uh, you can think of um, faculty as being the neurons in a campus and then the administration and the uh, you know, physical plant staff and the other support staff is sort of being glial cells. Everybody needs to come together to support uh, the, the, the whole, uh, but the glial cells are not actually transmitting any signal. They're, they have accessory uh, functions. So uh, the first is these ependymal cells. The primary function of these ependymal cells uh, is to produce um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So th the brain cells are in contact, are, are not in direct contact with blood. There's this blood brain barrier that I was hoping to end on today, but I probably won't get the time to get to it. Uh, uh, instead, they come in contact with what's called cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, this is a special fluid, sort of primordial broth, that the uh, that neurons actually derive their nutrients from and find themselves bathed in. This is uh, produced and monitored by ependymal cells. Next are astrocytes. Uh, as the name would have you believe, they are these star-looking cells uh, on histology. They're quite beautiful. Um, and their job, part of their job is to help maintain this blood-brain barrier. So they have all of these projections uh, that uh, extend out from them. These projections help maintain the three-dimensional structure of the brain. Um, and they're going to help regulate... Uh, nutrition, you know, the, the access of various nutrients and ions and whatever dissolved gases because they're helping to establish this blood-brain blood barrier. Um, and they're also involved in uh, neurotransmitter uh, recycling. All right. The next are oligodendrocytes. And uh, these are important uh, because they produce myelin. Uh, we've talked about myelin uh, already a little bit. Um, and in the central nervous system, they're produced by myelin. Uh, I'm sorry, by, by oligodendrocytes. The unique characteristic about uh, an oligodendrocyte is it has, the, there's the cell body, and then extending from the cell body are these projections that then wrap around the axon uh, of... Uh, two or more adjacent neurons, all right? So they are, um, they are not, uh, there's a single cell is not forming a single unit uh, or internode um, on, on the axon uh, like you're going to find in the peripheral nervous system. We'll talk about that in a bit. Those are Schwann cells. Uh, so I normally ask my class to, to think about why this may be that a single cell is interacting with multiple axons, but instead of taking the time, I'll give you the answer. Um, the reason that it is it's interacting with multiple cells at the same time, the first pass uh, understanding of that is it's helping to maintain the three-dimensional structure of the nervous tissue in the brain. 
you know, in the peripheral nervous system, you have nerves that are all going in the same direction, right? There's a, a nerve course, and they're all heading in the same direction. So there's not really uh, a, a, a complex three-dimensional architecture that needs to be maintained. There's simply a, a linear uh, path. Um, and so uh, in, the, in the nervous tissue, though, these oligodendrocytes provide an important uh, structural component uh, for the three-dimensional architecture of, of the brain. Microglia, these are the garbage trucks uh, of the brain. They are uh, picking, they're phagocytic cells, uh, which are going to be picking up different uh, cellular debris. Uh, and if there are any pathogens in the brain, hopefully there aren't, but sometimes there are, and microglia are on site. All right, and that, the microglia, that, they, they themselves are a category of, of cells, uh, which uh, we can talk, we will talk about a little bit uh, later. All right, so here are some pictures uh, of all these players in C2. This would be um, mostly gray matter in the brain. So you've heard of white matter and gray matter, right? So gray matter is where processing happens. White matter is, these, white matter is mostly tracts where signals are being sent along white matter. White matter are tracts. So gray matter is gray because we have a high density of cell bodies here. A lot of cell bodies, soma to the neurons. Uh, here's a cell body. We have all of, uh, uh, we have uh, an astrocyte here with the different extensions of the astrocyte on it. Uh, here are the ependymal cells. There are these cavities in the brain called ventricles. We'll show a picture of those in a bit. Uh, and these ependymal cells are here. They're producing cerebrospinal fluid, which is what's filling these, uh, these ventricles, is what they're called, the ventricles of the brain. Uh, here's a little microglial cell. And we do get to see uh, one uh, uh, oligodendrocyte that has a little bit of myelination happening uh, in this cartoon. Importantly here, we have a, uh, this would be um, a capillary, and that capillary is completely encased in projections from this uh, astrocyte. Yeah? Is the astrocyte for these nutrients to the neuron from the blood? It is, it is, has selective permeability. It has selective permeability. So the, there's only certain things that are going to be able to pass through this blood-brain barrier that you see right here that's being created by that astrocyte, all right? Selective permeability. What's the intracellular fluid there? Uh, this intracellular fluid is, is a very uh, a close analog to the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's in, it's in exchange with the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there, there is a passage more free passage between the ventricles and, and uh, the interstitium. Uh, okay. So then uh, this would be uh, white matter. Um, and these tend to be the tracts, as I was saying. So we have axons with an oligodendrocyte that is myelinating those tracts. It is white because of all this myelin. Uh, the, these uh, lipid bilators that get wrapped many times around the axon. Um, still capillaries with astrocytes that are forming this blood-brain barrier. Um, that's all I want to say there. Oops. Oops, come on back. Here we go. So, myelination. Um, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, myelination is caused by a Schwann cell. And what happens is this Schwann cell just sort of wraps itself like a hot dog bun at first around the axon, but then keeps going and just keeps wrapping itself and stretching itself uh, and compressing the uh, cytoplasm in that cell until we've formed many, many layers, which then get coated in this endoneurium. Uh, it is the innermost layer of... Uh, it's, it's the innermost layer of connective tissue. So just like there was the endomesium in muscles, 
that coat muscle fibers. The endoneurium is the connective tissue that covers uh, the, the Schwann cell, the, the myelin. Um, this plasma membrane here of the uh, axon itself is called the axolemma. And then the neurolemma is this outer uh, membrane of the um, it's the outer membrane of the, the Schwann cell. So just some, some definitions for you, some terms, some vocabulary. All right. So now in the peripheral nervous system, um, I probably could have cut that, that last slide out. There's Schwann cells, which I, I just talked about. And then uh, there are these uh, satellite cells. Um, and satellite cells... Uh, often are going to surround the uh, soma of the peripheral neurons uh, that you would find in a ganglia, like a sympathetic chain ganglia or uh, some other autonomic ganglia somewhere in the periphery. They're going to control uh, dissolved gases, nutrients, uh, and uh, neurotransmitters. Ne neurotransmitters. They're, they're basically controlling the environment, uh, the chemical environment. Uh, that the peripheral neurons in, in ganglia find themselves. All right. So um, I don't want to go through this in deep functional detail. All right. I, I want to just point out the different gross anatomical parts of the brain so we can talk about them a little bit. But I, I'm not going to go. This is. I'm not going into a lot of anatomy here. All right. Um, there are six regions of the brain, six large uh, categorical regions of the brain. And the first of them, the one that we think of the most uh, as being the brain when you have an elementary school child draw a picture, is the cerebrum. The cerebrum itself, however, is uh, these, these sort of, um, I don't want to say perhaps the least crucial part of the brain. It certainly is the part of the brain that we associate with ourselves the most. It's what gives us our consciousness and our personality, um, uh, the higher uh, intellectual capacity that we have. However, um, large portions of the cerebrum are not actually necessary for life. All right. Um, so there's the cerebrum. Um, and then below that, is the hindbrain here, the uh, cerebellum and the brainstem. Uh, the cerebellum is, um, so as we work our way down from the cerebrum, down uh, through the cerebellum and then uh, through the brainstem, which is embedded up in here, uh, we are sort of taking a trip back through evolutionary history, all right? Um, so the, the earliest organisms like amocetes that had, you know, a notochord with a little bit of a bulb on top uh, would be uh, deriving from the medulla oblongata. So the, the earliest chordates uh, were basically spinal cords. And then uh, we developed larger uh, structures. So when you're thinking about the function of the brain, you can imagine that the most fundamental regulatory mechanisms of the body, things that are going to regulate your breathing, uh, and, et cetera, are going to be uh, <coughs> cardioregulatory mechanisms, are all going to be uh, further down the brain stem, all right? And then the higher cognitive functions are, are up here. Um, the cerebellum is responsible for... Uh, learned behavior, rote behavior. So uh, when you're learning to play the piano, you are using uh, the somatic motor cortex in the cerebrum, but with time you have that muscle memory, uh, you learn that muscle memory, and the cerebellum becomes more and more involved in that. It's the cerebellum that becomes uh, disproportionately affected by alcohol. So when you get drunk and you can't walk straight, it's because you're messing with uh, those learned mechanisms, that muscle memory uh, that is encoded in the cere uh, cerebellum. 
diencephalon, uh, the, the two-parted uh, brain that is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The thalamus is an important relay station where if anything is to reach your consciousness, if you are to be aware of something, then there's going to have to be a synapse in the thalamus. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, and then the hypothalamus, uh, hypothalamus leads into the infundibulum and uh, the hypophysis or pituitary gland. This is an important, uh, this part of what's called the limbic system, which is kind of a squishy, uh, a squishy term related to emotions in, in, in the brain. Um, but it uh, is also the, the bridge uh, to the endocrine system. So the, the hypophysis or pituitary gland is sort of the, the top of the pyramid in the endocrine system, which we will talk about eventually. And that is uh, under the control of the hypothalamus. Uh, the, med, the midbrain or mesencephalon. Um, so the midbrain has uh, the corpora quadrigemina back here, which is important for uh, visual and auditory processing and then also the cerebral peduncles. These are cut here, but these are white tracks of ascending fibers that are branching and radiating up uh, as white tissue into the cerebrum. So this mesencephalon, this midbrain, uh, is, is important. Um, this is actually where um, if, if there's a lesion in the mesencephalon, uh, you ablate consciousness. A person does, uh, loses their conscious awareness. Uh, so there's some sort of functioning here that is, is uh, crucial to that. Uh, next down is the pons. Uh, this, is gonna, this is a relay center. And the, the pons and the medulla, um, these are all subconscious uh, functions. Uh, this is where a lot of the cranial nerves originate from. Um, and the, uh, uh, it's like the, the regulation of the heart rate and, and uh, blood pressure and, and various digestive functions all happen in the pons and the medulla oblongata. All right, so move on from there. These are the ventricles that I had uh, mentioned. I'm not going to get into this uh, in depth. I'm not, we're not going to learn. I don't want, you don't need to learn the actual names of them, the anatomy, but uh, this, these ventricles, these hollow spaces, they are void spaces, truly the hole in your head, uh, that are filled with the cerebrospinal fluid uh, that circulates. Um, it's produced by uh, this choroid plexus, which is made up of special ependymal cells, and gets uh, resorbed by the arachnoid granula. Uh, we'll see a picture of those in a, in a slide or two. Uh, functions here. It provides uh, buoyancy to the brain uh, and protection to the brain. So when you, you're head banging to your favorite doom metal uh, during the commercial breaks of uh, political debates, you uh, are protecting your brain. That cerebrospinal fluid is protecting uh, the, the soft tissue of the brain. Um, and it confers a, a level of chemical stability uh, to, to the environment of the brain. So uh, both in terms of nutrients, different chemical messengers, and metabolites that are being exported from those cells. Um, all right. So uh, the meninges, um, there are three layers of connective tissue su supporting uh, the brain, surrounding the brain, and I'll, I'll get through these and the arachnoid granula, and, I'll be, and that'll be time. Uh, so the three of them are the dura mater, uh, the, pia mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So dura mater, uh, the name meaning durable mother, these are the mothers of your brain. The, the dura mater is uh, this bilayer of uh, thick, um, supportive connective tissue that is surrounding uh, the entirety of the brain and spinal cord, the entire central nervous system. Just below that is this thing called the arachnoid mater, the spidery mother. 
and spidery mother uh, is, has these arachnoid granula that perforate the dura mater going into the venous drainage of the brain. And this is where cerebrospinal fluid is returned to general circulation, all right? So we talked about the choroid plexus and the, and the ependymal cells that are producing CSF. And this is how it gets back into the blood through these arachnoid uh, granula. Finally, there is pia mater, the, the little mother, which is a very fine membrane that's actually laying directly on top of uh, the surface of the neural tissue. Right below the uh, arachnoid mater. All right.